Welcome to this Autism Ontario webinar. My name is Matthew Lay, and as always, I will be your host. Today, we'll be seeking to better understand Indigenous perspectives on building inclusive autism practices with Grant Bruno. And before we get started, as always, I have a few things that I, I need to cover off. First off, um, opinions reflected in this webinar are those of the speakers and presenters and do not necessarily reflect Autism Ontario's views. Please note, Autism Ontario does not endorse any specific therapy, product, treatment strategy, opinion service, or individual. We do, however, support and endorse your right to information. Autism Ontario strongly believes that it is important to do your own research and make your own informed decisions. Now, with an aim of being inclusive, respectful, and representative of the many voices within our diverse community, we will use both identity first and person first referential language. We acknowledge that the use of language is evolving rapidly and will continue to be an ongoing discussion within the autism community. Now, a big part of what I do is I take your questions and I help get you answers. So you can submit your questions at any time uh, by using the ask question box. They will come into me and at various points within the presentation, I will attempt to get um, I will attempt to get answers from from Grant. Um, now, this is a big topic, and as such, there's probably going to be some stuff that we're not going to be able to get into as deeply as you may want us to. And as such, we have populated the resource section just full of all kinds of helpful links, documents, and the like to help you better understand the topic and get the help that you need. Make sure you check out the resource center. Um, now, if you have any issues at all, please click on the help button and a friendly reminder that this webinar will be recorded and will be available on the Autism Ontario website tomorrow. All right, now with all of that out of the way, it's time for me to welcome um, to the Autism Ontario desk for the first time, uh, Grant Bruno. Grant, thanks so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me and, uh, and giving me a, really an opportunity to share some of my knowledge, both as a, as a parent, as well as a researcher and as somebody who, you know, grew up on a reserve here in, in Treaty 6 territory. Yeah, so, you know, not everyone reads the bios before they come in. The topic often drives registration and you and I have had a good chat, but can you give our audience before we get into this just a little bit about yourself and your, uh, your background that brings you to this webinar today? For sure. So, Tante, Grand Bruno, Nitsigasen, Muskeksik, Akwa, Musquachis, Mochenia. Hello, everybody. My name is Grant Bruno. I'm from the communities of Musquachis, which is a large First Nations located in central Alberta, also in Treaty 6. But I didn't grow up there. I grew up in Enoch Cree Nation, which is a reserve just west of Edmonton. It's a smaller reserve, but I grew up there with my mom. And so I really have, and I tell people this all the time, deep, deep roots here in Treaty 6, as well as, you know, I think across both Saskatchewan and Alberta. And so as the this presentation kind of goes forward, I'll get more into those deep roots. Um, but also I'm a, I'm a parent, I have four children, two of which are autistic. And I'm a third year PhD student in medical sciences in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta. Okay, so we've got five sections to our presentation and we'll be pausing from time to time throughout sort of take questions um but the as a start you want to sort of set the stage right you're going to give us a bit of a, a high level overview for sure all right well let's jump into that and i'll be back when we have some questions from our audience okay sounds good so the first thing I like doing is really allowing people to understand where I'm coming from. And I do this for a couple of reasons. Um, but the first one is because in our communities, and I think this is pretty universal across First Nations, right across Canada, it's really, it's, it's not who you are, but it's whose you are. And what I mean by that is just yesterday, actually, I was out in community. I was at an elders forum happening in Musquachies. And anytime I met some an elder that I didn't recognize or I didn't know, one of the first things that I know that I'm, I'm supposed to do to, for them is really situate myself and position myself. And what I mean by that is 
the, one of the first questions they'll ask is, who are your parents? Who are your grandparents? Where did they come from? And they do this for, I think the main reason is really to allow themselves to build a relationship with you right away. And so I tell them, you know, my dad's Daryl Bruno. He was in the RCMP for, for many, many years. And then they recognize that name and like, oh, I know your dad. And then right then and there, they're able to really, you know, connect with me in a different way than if I were to just show up as a PhD student, right? And then I tell them my mom's Deborah Cutknife. And then they, oh, I know the Cutknifes. Um, and it's just a really healthy, meaningful way to build that connection with people right away. Now, I see this a lot with the elders. Unfortunately, the younger generation, which includes me, we don't do this as much and we should, but we're starting to do it more. And I'm starting to do it more now, even when I'm traveling. So um, last March, I was actually in Toronto and I was at a hotel downtown and I seen a, a visibly native man. And I went up to him and asked him, where are you from? And he said he was from this Cree community near James Bay. And then we started to talk more about, you know, the different dialects of Cree and how they speak Cree. And it's so much different than how my community would speak Cree. But then we got to talking about his son and his son was actually a university student at the University of Alberta. And I've actually met his son. And so again, it's not who you are, but whose you are. And then so really looking for those opportunities for us to be able to build those connections with each other in a very relational and I would argue very indigenous way. So for myself, I have connections to Ogimao Papasteo, who was chief woodpecker. So he would have been a chief of a reserve which in what would have been known now as Southern um, Edmonton, um, known as Papish Chase. It was illegally surrendered in the, in the 1900s. And so that, that side of my family actually broke up. And there's Brunos all over Alberta now because of it. So some went to Musquatchies, some went to Enoch, some went up north. Um, I'm always constantly finding Brunos all over. And so that whole experience, I think really, you know, took a lot from my family though, you know, land resources and things. And so my family was had to kind of survive and just make, make ends meet as, as they were trying to find a place to stay. On my mom's side, I have connections to Ogimao, Mr. Hemasqua, who was a, a really prominent chief in the, in the late 1800s. He was an original signatory to Treaty 6, and he was really well known as, um, as a really generous and kind and compassionate chief who really knew how to negotiate them on behalf of his people. And so you can see just how deep the roots run, right? And I'm really grateful for that. But at the same time, I'm only learning these things as an adult, as I have more conversations with, with, with elders, with people in my community, and I'm starting to learn more about my own history. And the reason for that is because of how much colonialism has taken away. I did not grow up with the culture. I didn't grow up with the, the language. My parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents were forbidden from, from speaking the language. And so my mom, as well as my, both of my grandmothers, both paternally and maternally, all attended residential schools. And so they were, their experiences in these schools were, were horrible. Um, so my mom attended the Hobima residential school. So Musquachis used to be known as Hobima and so this Hobima Residential School is actually one of Canada's largest. I think at its peak, it had upwards of 600 children attending the school a year. And this, so they had children from all over um, BC and Saskatchewan, and they would ship them here, actually. They would fly them out and, and, make, and force them to attend um, these schools because they really wanted to civilize and they wanted to, you know, as... Um, as Duncan Campbell Scott once said, to kill the Indian and the child. And so I'm still dealing with a lot of that even today. I see a lot of the, the dysfunction in our communities really rooted in trauma. And that trauma was caused first by the Indian Act and then through the Indian Act, the, the residential school system. From there, um, so I'm a, I'm a registered member of Samson Cree Nation. Um, and so Musquachese is made up of four different reserves. One of those is, so the four reserves are Samson, where I'm from, Ermanskin, Louis Bull and Montana. Now, this is important because when we're thinking about disability services in First Nations, one thing that I have to do is I have to navigate four different systems when I'm going out to community. I have to engage with four different chiefs and councils, four different political agendas, and it makes things really difficult to get things centralized. Now, there are some disability services in the community 
And these are all located within the education system. So in 2017, all the different bands got together and they, they decided to amalgamate the different, the different schools. And so rather than having each school under a different chief and council, they put them all under their own umbrella. And then now they have an education authority that is in charge of all the education, which is a good thing. And so the, all of the disability services that children can access are all in the school system. And the beautiful thing about that is that they actually provide disability services for children without a diagnosis. Now, this doesn't happen very often, but again, our community is really trying to meet the families where they're at. Now, getting a diagnosis in our community is a huge challenge. You know, there's fear, there's poverty, there's systemic barriers. There's all these different factors that go into making sure that a child, a family um, is, is, is unable to really get that assessment that they need for their child. So now, so again, just a little bit more, more about me. I have four children. Two of my sons are, are autistic. And as we all know, like you, you've met, if you met one autistic person, you've just met one autistic person. And so my older, so I have twin boys, they're 13. The older one, Marshall, he's autistic and his brother Oliver is not. And then I have my eight year old Anders, Anders is autistic. Then I have a twin, gonna be three year old daughter who's not autistic. Now, if you were to com like compare Anders and Marshall as both being on the spectrum, Marshall, you wouldn't really recognize as autistic right away, unless you had a lot of experience and a lot of um, knowledge about it. He, like academically, he does fine. He was hitting all of his developmental milestones. Where it really started to show was in social situations, as well as around really loud noises. So like in, in, in music class in grades ones and two, he, he did not like it. It was too much for him. And then and so we decided through a school, through the recommendation of a school to get him a, an assessment at the local um, assessment clinic. And then so that he was assessed and, and diagnosed in grade two. And then my son Anders, I was really concerned about him because, you know, he was two and a half, three years old, still wasn't saying any words. And so I went ahead and put him on the, the wait list at, a, at an entirely different assessment center. And there's a reason for that. So the, the assessment center that I used for Marshall, they kept the parents largely out of the entire assessment process. Now that's hugely problematic for me as a very relational person. I want my children to know that I'm there for them. And this assessment center didn't allow that. And I'm, I, and I unfortunately I've told some parents not to use them, even though they have less wait times, because I felt like my son Marshall wasn't being himself. There it was very clinic, very much, very unnatural. I just felt like we were, we were cut out of the entire process. And I was like, this is not how things should be done. I knew that even before I even started any of this research. And so for my son, Anders, we brought him to Edmonton and that process was a lot more inclusive. It was a lot more, the parents were involved. We were there the entire time. They allowed us to ask questions as we went. Even after the, the assessment had been done and they, they recommended that, okay, Anders, we're gonna recommend him to be diagnosed. Um, we felt like it was a lot more like gentle and just a bit more inclusive and, and really wanting to work with us rather than just cutting us out of the process. So we, I've gone through two different assessment centers, two very different experiences. And, I, and now that I'm on the other side and I'm doing this work and I'm doing this research, I'm learning that, you know, I don't really blame these assessment centers for kind of the approach they use. This is just how they've been trained. And so I think there's even before the assessment happens, there has to be a fundamental shift in how we are assessing and working with autistic children and adults. And I'll get to this in a second. Um, I often tell people that children guide me. So as a Cree person, as somebody who is now reconnecting back with my culture as much as I can, I'm learning that our approaches to parenting, to, to family and to, and to our communities is just different than the Western model. And so I'm always trying to make sure that my children are, that they're guiding me as well as I'm guiding them. Our children in my culture are here to teach us. And our children are much more connected to the creator than anybody else. And so through that connection, I'm always just observing my children of what they're trying to bring to my life as well. And the learnings that come from that. 
And then finally, I've been conducting research in muskrat sheets for eight years now. I'm super grateful for it. The research has actually been a big part of my own healing journey. I've been able to connect with elders and the community in different ways that I never would have thought of possible. So really looking for opportunities to give back to the community. So I, I think a lot of this goes without saying um, earlier in the, they, you know, we talked about the terminology and using first person language. I use autism rather than ASD. I use neurodiversity or acceptance first. And I, I, I will never consider myself an autism expert because I do not have the lived experience of being autistic. And I think that's where the real expertise is. And that's where I've learned the most from. It isn't from, now I've learned a lot through, you know, research articles and, and different things like that. But where I really, I felt like I learned the most was from the autistic community. So going to, you know, um, even something like Twitter and learning from there or learning from having conversations with autistic researchers are the ones that I'm trying to gather my knowledge from and then share that as well. Um, and then the quote, the quote on the right really, I think explains my approach and how, how my approach to autism has always been. I've never really tried to change my sons in ways that I was trying to like get rid of the autism. That's never been the goal for me. I've always just tried to really fully accept them for who they are, autistic or not. And I think that approach is for me is where I'm going to, where, where I've gotten the best results. So rather than me trying to, you know, treat their autism or fix or cure or all these different terms that we could use, I, I took an approach of fully accepting them. And then I, and then I worked with them in areas that I thought were going to be best. Right. So I do, we do speech language therapy in my home. We do occupational therapy in my home. He does go to my son. Anders is what in what's known as interactions program in Edmonton public. And so I've been able to craft this kind of therapy approach with them, but not in the goal of trying to change them, but just to better support them as a parent. So a little bit about indigenous terminology. So of course, Canada's rec constitution recognizes First Nations, Métis, Inuit. There are approximately 1.4 indigenous peoples here in Canada today. There are vast differences in language, geography, and experiences. So even just here in Alberta, if you were to compare the Blackfoot language to the Cree language, they're, they're hugely different. You might as well speak, be speaking German and, and French. And one thing that I see all the time is this pan-indigenization, which can be really problematic because it doesn't, um, it doesn't address or, or really honor the uniqueness our communities represent. And so when you're working in community, as much as you think you know about that community, unless you're learning specifically from them, I would, my approach would always be don't assume anything and just learn how to ask really good questions. Um, so terms such as Indian, Aboriginal, Native aren't really used anymore. Um, indigenous is appropriate. It's in my title, but I don't identify as indigenous. It's, I don't go around telling people I'm indigenous. I go say I'm Cree. I'm a Cree person. I come from a Cree community. My tribe is Cree. Um, and then the other thing that we really identify with is our, our families, actually. So our last names. And again, so I'm, my mom's a cut knife. My dad's a Bruno lightning. And so those would be my, my identifiers as well. So now I just want to just touch on something that I call the, oh, we're going to ask a question. Um, I just have one um, that uh, came in that I think is, 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 is pertinent to this section here is, um, are we going to talk about it later or might we discuss the potential differences in philosophy between indigenous culture and behavioral approaches? Um, this person finds that they, what they know of indigenous culture, indigenous culture is that it's much more aligned with a developmental relationship based approach. Is that are those your thoughts as well? Um, spread, shed some light on that. Yes. So I'm going to touch on that again a little bit later, but I find our relationality and that ability to connect with children for me anyways, in community, when I'm bringing the culture in, is just, a, it, you can build a deeper connection. So for example, when I bring in, you know, a speech language pathologist into my home, one thing we do is we smudge and we do this to really set the environment. And so when we smudge, there's a certain smell and you're able to, you know, talk a little bit about what you're going to do and you set an intent. So rather than them just coming in and going straight to work and then leaving, 
we're really trying to build a relationship between the, the speech language or the occupational ther therapist and my child, because it's through that relationship that we're going to get the best results. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'll let you get back to it. And for, for that questioner, um, we'll be getting more on this later and please continue to submit your questions. We got, um, we got more opportunities to get them answered for you in a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. So now I, I want to touch on something that I describe as the indigenous deficit discourse. So the, the, so this happens in, in multiple areas and it, it's all, in, it's, I would really argue it's really all encompassing, right? So we, if you see a, a news story in the media about Musquachiza or Horbima, it's often going to be very negative and very deficit based. Right. So, and then the same thing is happening in research. And the same thing happens um, in multiple areas right, right across. And it's, it's really kind of concerning for me because when I go out to community, I, don't get me wrong. Like I, I acknowledge everything that the bad that's happening in our community, but, but, my goal for my research is to very much share the strengths or the opportunities in my community too. And those often don't get shared. And so I'm just gonna read this quote. Um, so it's deficit-based research can contribute to stigmatization when problematic health issues are repeatedly characterized in the context of a specific population. Additionally, when any given health deficit is repetitively associated with indigenous peoples, through research, there is a risk of stereotyping. Unfortunately, due to a, crack of, a lack of critical exposure in education and media, deficit-based research given without proper framing can perpetuate negative characterizations of Indigenous people. Now, the example I like to use with this is epidemiology. So epidemiology is often used by the government to justify discriminatory health policies towards Indigenous people. For example, here in Alberta, the, the government of Alberta has a certain formula that they use for funding education. And then they go and use their own numbers to kind of craft this, these programs. And then we say, you have how many people in your community? And here's the numbers we have, and this is what we're giving you. What we found, so there's a, there was a research study done about three years ago that looked at on-reserve populations. So the, the provincial government thought it was about 80, 90,000 people on reserve. In this other study, we found there was about 140,000 people. But right then and there, you can see a huge discrepancy between the numbers that the province is using and the actual numbers that are happening in our communities. And then you look at that funding model, and they're gonna, they're gonna, they are going to fund a lot less based on their own numbers. And this happens time and time again. And so I'm always in my community saying we need to get our own stats done. We need to be able to do our own research, build our own evidence base so that we can start challenging this indigenous deficit discourse. Now, if we were to change the word indigenous or the term indigenous to autistic, my argument has always been the exact same thing is happening. The government is going to use their own numbers. They're going to use, they're also going to use lack of evidence. So they won't come to our communities because um, because they feel like it's a federal responsibility. So there's a jurisdictional divide happening, and this happens in Ontario as well. I don't, I'm not sure about the details, but I'm sure it's there. So in Alberta, um, most of the disability, including autism services and supports are with the province. So here we have PDD and FSCD. So they're the two main ones. And on reserve is considered federal jurisdiction. And so the province doesn't want to come in and provide the services. The federal government says the province has to, and then nothing happens. And this is where you get something like Jordan's principle, right? Because time and time again, in 2016, the federal government was found guilty of human rights abuses against indigenous children. And then they fought this decision. They, they, they're continuing to fight this decision, actually. And so my, my argument is that the federal government, it is their responsibility, but the province needs to work in coordination with the federal government to make sure that all children aren't being left out, especially autistic peoples in my, from my research. <clears throat> 
And so you can see that this deficit discourse, including using stats and, and numbers in a, in a very negative and harmful way, or you, using the lack of stats and numbers in a very negative and harmful way is causing a lot of harm in our communities. And my argument has always been that children with disabilities living on reserve are, probably, are, are the most marginalized group within Canada. And we have two different funding bodies, two different people who are supposed to be here for the children are fighting with each other of who's supposed to do what. And then on top of that, we have our own chiefs and councils who are not having these conversations yet. So you have this perfect recipe for children to really be struggling and having these challenges in our communities. Now, this is just to kind of follow up on that. I'm not going to read it, but the DSM-5, you know, you can see the language here, right? So deficits, deficits, and abnormal, reduced deficits, poorly. And language matters. How we frame people using the language we use matters. And so I can't even imagine for my sons, if they were to read this, how, what kind of, how would they feel about that? They'd feel like a burden. They'd feel like something's wrong with them. And so it's, I think it's really important for, for anybody working in our communities to really think about the language we're using, right? And I'm sure most of us, you know, we've gone through a process of beca becoming non-ableist, including myself. Unfortunately, I, I, it's one of the things that I struggled with and I, I still continue to, right? So using ableist language, something that I have to constantly be conscious of. And I'm getting better at it, but I'm nowhere near where I want to be. And on top of that, I, I've become, I've gone beyond just non-ableist. I'm anti-ableist now. So if I hear other people using certain language or use terms, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quick to kind of challenge them on that in, in healthy ways. I'm not attacking people. I'm not out there on Twitter just like making a bunch of <laughs> conflict for myself, but using really healthy ways of like using the relationship again. And then saying to them, you know, maybe what you said was inappropriate, but here's a better way. So just a little bit about disabilities and colonialism. I talked about residential schools for so the forced removal of children. Um, this kind of breaks my heart, but like if my son Anders were to go, would have went to residential school, he wouldn't have lived. There's absolutely no way. He would have been abused and there's absolutely no way he would have survived that experience because he would stop talking and just the amount of abuse that already was happening on top of that being nonverbal would have been uh, pretty much a death sentence for him. So I'm, I'm grateful that and my mom tells me this all the time that she went through what she went through. So we didn't have to. <clears throat> um, of course, there's loss of kinship, language and culture. So I talked about how I'm learning a, a lot about myself and my history and my culture as an adult. But at the same time, culture in our communities is still very much a privilege. You know, when you're dealing with poverty and you're dealing with all the dysfunction that's happening in the background, putting time, effort and money into reconnecting to your culture just isn't possible for some of our families. And so I think it's really important when you want to work with our communities, don't assume we're all cultural and don't assume we're all trying to reconnect because some some people in our communities, they practice Christianity and they don't want anything to do with it. So I, like, again, I think it's really important to learn how to ask really good questions. Um, so there's something called, I would call medical colonialism. So a lot of people learn about residential schools. There was another system put in place in the healthcare. So we have education, but we have a, we had our own segregated healthcare system called Indian hospitals. And so there was one Indian hospital in Edmonton it was called the Charles Camsell Hospital. And at this hospital, they actually performed nutritional experiments on First Nations children. And so they, they did this and they actually developed Canada's original food guide from it. And so these experiments was that they would sometimes starve these children or feed them one thing over and over and over and over again. And this happened in the 1950s. And it wasn't until after World War II that, you know, we see Nazi Germany experimenting on humans, that Canada realized that they were doing the exact same thing here, right? And so they, that, that, that idea that, you know, we're less than or we're not human was very much prominent within Canada as well. And so 
But there's other things that were happening too, right? Like forced sterilization. These are all forms of medical colonialism. There's of course, inequitable access to healthcare and services. So again, even healthcare is a, is a provincial matter. We're federal and there's a lot of, a lot of tension there. Um, and a lot of imposed Westernized views, right? So seeing disability as this really negative, horrible thing is very Western. Whereas in our community, um, and I'll touch on this a, a little bit later, some of our traditional knowledge keepers would have seen autistic children and autistic people as gifted, as a, as a, as a something to be celebrated. <clears throat> and so really looking at how do we, you know, navigate that, 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 <clears throat> what's going on in our communities. And then trying to, for me, trying to bring back some of that tradition back to my community. So on the right, we have something called the, what, so there's a section in the Indian Act. So this was developed in 1876. It's still very much the law of the land for First Nations. And there's a section in there called mentally incompetent Indians. And basically what this does is it gives the federal minister full jurisdiction over mentally incompetent Indians who live on reserve over, you know, their, their, their property that they're supposed to have and whether or not they need to be institutionalized and so on and so forth. And so the power or authority over these people, which would have been autistic people actually lies in the federal government and not the community and not the families. And so you can see just, you know, the things that we're still dealing with in our communities that are still very much affecting us today. Okay, so now I'm going to be going into a little bit about the PhD research, but I think we have a question first. Yeah, before we get into the into the research, um, the uh, one of the questions here is: um, Have you seen, or are we seeing in general, connections amongst international Indigenous communities with the Canadian Indigenous communities, uh, mm -hmm. ways of being as it um, approaches to autism and autistic realities? So I have yet to see anything formal. I'm sure there's conversations happening without my knowledge, but this is something that I, I would love to address. And so I was just at the INSAR meeting in Stockholm, Sweden. And so I was meeting with some of the INSAR. So INSAR is the International Society of Autism Research. And so they have this big conference every year. I think there's like 2,500 people that show up. And so next year's conference is happening in Melbourne, Australia. So Australia has a, a big indigenous population. I would argue they're further along than Canada when it comes to autism research with indigenous populations. And so myself and my supervisors, um, Dr. David Nicholas and Dr. Lonnie Zweigenbaum, um, we're going to put in what's known as a special interest group to look exactly like this. So we really want to explore what does autism look like for indigenous populations globally? And so we're going to be have a, a meeting there with other indigenous peoples right across the globe to really start to have those conversations in a more formal way, but also learn from each other. Um, but as of today, I've, I've met a couple of people just on my own and in really informal settings. There's nothing formalized yet, though. OK, and then this this next question um, was flagged for me. It's a huge one. So maybe you can you can give just a few bullets or points to some some good resources, but as a non-Indigenous parent, how do I support my child who is Indigenous? This would be an amazing question for my wife who just walked out. <laughs> oh, she's non-Indigenous. We have a daughter together. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's really for her anyways. When I see her parenting her, she's really open to my daughter practicing the culture. She's never had anything against it. You know, my wife's come to ceremony with me. She got her ceremony name. She's really, she's lived on a reserve with me. She's really open to the idea of like, okay, if I'm going to have children with this person and this person's culture is so important to them that I'm going to be able to put myself into really uncomfortable situations at time to make sure that I can better support my child later on. And so we go to powwows and we go do all these cultural things and we're both willing to put ourselves in, into a little bit of discomfort for it. And so I think that that ability to be open-minded, but also think about, okay, you know, it's really uncomfortable going into these situations, but I'm willing to deal with that for a bit because later on it does get more, you get more familiar with it and you do get better at it. Nice. Okay. Well, let's get into the research. Um, I know we're all eager to, to see this. <laughs> 
Yes. So I think that for the PhD research, I'm still very much, so I did my candidacy in April. I'm doing data collection right now. And so there's only really been one study done to date. But even before that, I knew that there was a lot of work to do. So when I was doing my master's, I was like, you know what, I'm going to learn about autism as much as I can because now I have two autistic children. And I quickly realized that there's very little research in the Canadian context on Indigenous peoples and autism. And so just doing my own kind of literature review, very informal, um, I knew that for me anyways, I was going to have to learn about it as much as I can and to become a better parent, but also to bring that back to my community. I really wanted my, my research to be community led and that doesn't happen very often. And so me being a community member and then having the, the, the perspective and experience as a parent, I really, I, what I would describe, I'm, I'm really doing insider, insider researcher. And so I'm really, I have to be really accountable to the community. So I'm really respectful and I'm trying to build really healthy relationships. <clears throat> and so I knew that my research had to be strength-based. You know, I talked about the indigenous deficit discourse. My research is really challenging that. And so really looking at opportunities to really connect with people from the community to really allow them to share their own stories. And then for me to learn from those stories in a strength-based way. And so I'm, use, I'm also using what's known as decolonizing methods or methodologies. And so I'm bringing as much of the, the culture into my research as well. Language, you know, I do ceremony for the, I did a ceremony for the, for the, as kind of the foundation for everything else, right? I brought those prints and tobacco. And on top of that, I'm, I'm, I have a, an elder on my PhD committee. And so using all these different things to really make sure that what I'm doing is reflective of the community. Um, again, my research is in partnership with the Muskogee's Education School Commission. So that's the local education authority where the disability services are housed at currently. Um, another really important part to my research is that it's action oriented. A lot of research I find can be really extractive. It's like, I'm going to go get what I need from the community and then I'm not going to give anything back. And that's hugely problematic because that again, goes against my worldview as a Cree person. We're really, we're relational, but within those relationships, we're really reciprocal. And so what I take out, I have to give back. And so, so far, and I'll, I'll share a link to this later. I've produced a short documentary for the community. Um, me and another community member, we plan monthly parent support groups for, for autistic, uh, for parents who have autistic children. And so next month or next week, actually, we're going to be going to the power grounds and then we're going to be doing like an autism 101 for the parents, as well as allowing them to, you know, practice some of the culture. <clears throat> and then looking for other sensory autism friendly cultural events. So in the documentary that I'll share later, we have a tea dance ceremony and we really wanted to adapt it a bit to allow autistic children and their families to come and attend. Um, and then on June 22nd for the Muskogee's Education School Commission, they have an annual traditional powwow. It's a one day powwow. It's a big celebration, but we've been working with the schools actually to, the, to create a, a sensory teepee. So the sensory TP is going to allow the, the children who attend school to come to the event. And if they start to get overwhelmed or things, or they just want to break from everything, they're able to come to this TP and really, <clears throat> and really just uh, like, and not be so like overwhelmed with all the sounds and noises that can come along with a, with a powwow. So again, the, the studies that I'm doing, so study one was the scoping review. So this review really comprehensively looked at all the literature across Canada as it pertains to autism and indigenous peoples. <clears throat> so what I found was that there was 24 articles total. Um, and I also layered that with a indigenous quality assessment tool. So of those 24 articles, only four of them were considered good quality. And this is concerning for me, especially when you think about Bill S-203. So Bill S-203 mandates the federal government to do a national autism strategy. And so they're going to be doing um, a one and a half year engagement on it. And this is the literature that they're going to be drawing from. And it's of low quality. There's not very much. And for me, that's concerning, especially when you're trying to develop legislation from it. And so there's a huge gap right now in the literature that I'm trying to address with my research. And I know there's a few other researchers as well, but mine is the only one that I think is community led. 
Um, so for the second study, we're really looking at traditional understandings of autism. So this is where I'm at in my research right now. I've been doing interviews with elders and really just trying to gather their perspectives on autism from a traditional perspective as well as a contemporary perspective. Um, and so in these early conversations, we would have, again, seen autism as a gift, as something to be celebrated. And so I'm trying to, <clears throat> wanting, I'm really wanting to um, explore that with the community and then bring those findings to everybody else. And then study three is really looking at community perspectives of autism. So this one's going to be done in partnership both with Musquachese, where I'm from, as well as the Six Nations of the Grand River, where I was able to go visit in March. And so really looking to explore autism with the families and seeing their, their, their challenges as well as their opportunities and how do we learn from that? And then how do we eventually start to hopefully start building programs around these findings? And so really allowing families, again, to come and share their stories. So these are just some of the early findings. Um, I've been doing community engagement since I started the PhD. I've had conversations right across Canada probably a thousand plus, you know, family, I've had parents reach out, educators, clinicians, um, everybody who had some sort of interest in autism has reached out at some point, I think. Um, so what I'm learning is that there's a lot of still misinformation in our communities of what autism is. And this misinformation creates a lot of fear. And that fear acts as an obstacle to getting a diagnosis, right? So these other obstacles to getting that diagnosis could be the poverty that you're dealing with, right? Transportation, childcare. Um, this is actually the amazing thing is through these com community conversations, we've been able to build a relationship with the local assessment center. And now we're going to be piloting a, a diagnostic um, assessment clinic in the community one day a month to really try and reach those families that might not be able to make it to a clinic. And so again, just really trying to address multiple things within the research. And this is one of the barriers was like, we just couldn't get our families to that clinic. So they're coming to us now, which is amazing. Um, families have to leave the reserve for better access to services. Um, for example, even myself, my son was living with his mom. He, she just couldn't access the same services as me because I'm living in the city. And so we had to have a really tough conversation and a really hard decision to really try and um, bring him to me so that we could get him those supports and services. So unfortunately, bad politics do get in the way. Everybody has a political agenda, and it's something that I'm trying to address again. Um, there are missed opportunities for intervention. So my son went to the daycare on reserve, and they didn't bring it up to us. And it's something that I had to go do on my own. Um, there's a lot of apprehension when working with the provincial government, mistrust, just like, what are you here for? We don't want to do this. Funding doesn't always equate success. And then there's an urgent need for evidence to justify the decisions that we're making, right? So us being able to do our own research is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, reserves are not friendly to disabilities in general. There's a lot of ableism. Nobody's really thinking about these. And so I'm hoping that with the conversations that I'm having, that we can start to shift that thinking a bit and start to make our, our, our spaces and our, our, our events more, more inclusive. So here are some of the positives. Um, huge amount of interest in this work, which I'm really grateful for. I'm having amazing co uh, conversations, not only my communities, but communities right across Canada. We're really good at acceptance in my community. Um, you know, when parents come to me, they just say, you know, that's my child. I'm going to love them no matter what, diagnosed or not. I love my child. And, that, and I think that's a, a beautiful strength-based approach to parenting. Autism, again, can be sometimes viewed as a gift. There's some really inspiring allyship stories. So we have healthcare providers in our community that are doing amazing work. And these are the people that I think that a lot of us can learn from because how do they do that, right? Uh, so families are really trying. It's just that to some of these barriers, they're, they're, they can, they're basically like, they can, they can feel like they, they can't be addressed, unfortunately, especially when you've been dealing with so much trauma, and so much poverty getting you know, the supports and services for your child might not even be the, the most important thing in that moment. It could be getting food on the table. It could be getting a house to live in, right? Um, so kinship supports in the community are great. So when we do our monthly autism support group, a lot of gookums, and for us, that's grandmas, show up. They show up with their, with their, with their child. 
And then their child is usually the one who has an autistic child. And so it's very kinship based. Um, cultural continuity is really important. So studies have shown that the more culture First Nations people, First Nations community has, including language, the better their health outcomes are. And that's one of the, I think, the strengths of Musquatchies is we're, we are rich in culture. It's just getting that culture into the spaces we need. Jordan's principle, again, is a big plus. It is getting harder and harder for our families to access, but I'm always advocating for our families to tell them that Jordan's principle wasn't done by the, the goodness of the federal government's heart. It's an actual legal mechanism that they are obligated to give to our families, but we need to start learning how to craft our arguments better. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of opportunities for shared learning for Indigenous health and autism researchers. Like I said, we're going through a lot of the same things. And so I hear things like nothing about us without us. We've been doing that for decades. Why don't we get together and collaborate at some point? Okay, so um, we have some um, questions that have come in about the research. Um, the first one is um, there are many concerns about how the Autism Alliance is obtaining only surface level insights from autistics in order to inform the autism strategy. Are you actively working with the Indigenous autistic researchers and Indigenous autistic advocates so their voices can be heard and their strategy and a strategy be deployed? And so I think that's where a lot of my research comes in is it's so the, the one of the most amazing things about my research, I think, is that a fact that it's grassroots. And so I'm really trying to make sure that people whose voices rarely get shared or, or we get to learn from are being shared in healthy and positive ways. So when I'm thinking about something like the National Autism Strategy, it feels already to me very hierarchical, right? So it's top down. We're going to go work with you know certain organizations. And hopefully those organizations have enough experience with autism that they can inform this. Whereas my research is bottom up. I'm very much in the community, working with families, supporting them as much as I can, but also learning too, right? So bringing those learnings, you know, spaces like this. And so you can see that there's a, a just a different approach. Now, doing a national autism strategy is, is a huge challenge just by itself. When you factor in the indigenous peoples and how diverse and how much you know colonialism has taken away um it'll be interesting to see how they address that now i don't i haven't been asked to be a part of it so i can't really uh, I talk to like the the bit my ability to influence it in any way but it'll be for me i'm gonna even if i'm on the outside it'll be interesting to see you know how they address those challenges because i have yet to see a national anything when it comes to indigenous peoples be successful. Okay, um, <clears throat> you, touched, you touched on some of this. Um, we have somebody whose family's moving to to a reserve, um, and they're interested in hearing ab about more inclusive cultural practices for their kids, including how they can ac accommodate or advocate for the or advocate for them within the indigenous community and how their kids can include their cultural practices in school and and other um, and other uh, it says moving on reserve. So I'm wondering if they're moving on to a reserve or moving away from from, from a reserve based around uh, this question. But uh, but they're. No, nope, they're moving into a they're moving to a reserve. So you gave some information about about some of the stuff you needed to do. But for someone who's moving maybe for the first time, as it relates to this, what are your what's the, what advice can you give uh, this family? And I think it really depends on which province you live in. So for me, okay. I'll just use my experience as somebody who lives in Alberta. Um, personally, I don't think I could move to the reserve right now, just because I'm thinking about my my children as they get older. And then, so just that lack of services makes things very challenging. And so I had, so we had to really think about pros and cons, right? So yes, we would have been closer to culture. We would have been able to um, connect with family members and use that as our supports, but getting my son the services that I, I think he really needs more. And that's like speech language and, and OT. We have to make that decision of like, okay, we just we can't move out there. And even if we could, we probably wouldn't. And so here in Alberta, we have something known as um, PDD. So that's persons with developmental disabilities. And it's supposed to be a form of funding, like um, a, fund, a monthly funding mechanism that adults can access. Now, it's impossible, and I'm not saying this word lightly, 
and possible for, for, for adults with disabilities who live on reserve to access that funding. Like you can apply, but you will get denied. And so now what we're seeing is, so Treaty 7, which is just south of where I live, there's another human rights tribunal coming up for adults now. And so you're seeing those same human rights abuses for adults with disabilities, including autistic adults, happening that the children were dealing with. Um, so children become adults, right? Like it doesn't end, the, the discrimination just didn't end as soon as they turned 18, it actually got worse. <laughs> and just those factors alone just would make it for me. Now, I, I, I understand I come from a very privileged place as a person who's highly educated. Um, I, find, I, I have access to financial resources. I can go out to the community when I want to, and some people can't, right? So just taking all those different, my own experiences and perspectives, um, I don't know. Yeah. No, I mean, we want you to be honest here. That's what th this is about, right, is, is, yeah. is sharing that. And you've got a very unique experience in that you have a child and you have, you have that, that close relationship. We have nine minutes to go in our scheduled time. A reminder to everyone, we never get to all the questions. We'll aspire to get you answers later. But when we were doing our, our pre-conference, we called this the, the good part. And so, Grant, I'm going to give you some time to go through these uh, this next section. Great. Thank you. So now I'm going to get into the more cultural understandings of what it means to be as a parent to um, our children, not just, my, not just autistic children. So for me, anyways, what I'm trying to do is trying to really build the language as a foundation. And so for in our communities, what you're seeing here is the Cree language and specifically the, the Plains Cree, right? So there's different types of Crees. I'm, I, I'd be considered Plains Cree, you have Woodland Cree, Swampy Cree, James Bay Cree. Um, and so the language dialects actually change between each as well. And so my, my perspective is, is Plains Cree. And so the word we would use for child is awasis. And so we would describe this as, um, as this term as a child, or rather a small animate being, or a small traveling spirit, or a small spirit engaged on a human journey. And so there you can see that our language is a very, it's, it is a very spiritual one, and it's something that I would argue is spiritually nourishing. So the more I'm learning the language, the more spiritually nourished I feel, and, I, and, that's, and the healthier I am. And so when I think about my, my, my approach to parenting, this is what it's really rooted in, is understanding that my children, they're just little spirits, and I'm, it's my, my responsibility to nurture their spirits as well. And so when I'm doing smudging, that's nurturing their spirits. And it's understanding that their relationship is much closer to what we call the creator than anybody else. And so the other next word is for, for mother, so my mother. And this term really honors a child's relationship to their birth mother. And it recognizes the sacred role a child's mother has with bringing them into the world and giving them the gift of life. So we often say that pregnancy in, our, in my community is a ceremony. Like that ability to, to create and bring life into this world is something we should all support and celebrate and do as much as we can to make sure it's as healthy as we can. But unfortunately, because of colonialism and all the trauma and everything else, this doesn't happen nearly as often as it should. But the more I'm able to bring these culture and the words and the language back to the community, the more we're able to support our families from a cultural foundation, which is really important. And so the next word is for nota we. And so this is the term for my father. So again, this would be me. If I were to use nota we, I'd be talking about my dad, but my children, when they use this term, they're talking about me. And again, it really identifies and um, celebrates that relationship between the child and the father. So our language isn't just about describing the person, but it's also about building that connection between the different kinship ties. And this is important because, again, we're going back to relationships. So when we're thinking about the services we want to give and support our children, support these families with, they all have to be rooted in relationships. Now, unfortunately, the funding mechanisms that we use in this area, so let's say, for example, um, my son SLP comes in, they have an hour, that's all they get paid for, then they're gone. 
I try and carve out a, a piece of that hour just to build a relationship between them. Now, I'm not saying people shouldn't get paid. Everybody should get paid for their work. But make sure that you're able to start to think about the relationship that you're building in our communities with these families. And here's what I would call a Cree model of parenting. So in the middle, you can see Awasis again, and then be around it, you can see those kins, the kinship ties. And then around that, you can see something we would call Wotoktuin. Um, so Wotoktuin in, our, in, our, in my language, in my culture, is what I would consider a, a Cree legal tradition. And so these are what we are, would have guided us in a, in, a, in, a more, in a legal sense, in a natural law sense. And so again, Wotoktuin is really the law of relationships. And again, relationships are everything to us. They're the most important thing. Um, I would argue that our approach to relationship is one of the reasons why things aren't any worse in our communities. So we often talk about prison populations being um, being uh, a lot, being so high with the indigenous peoples, right? So in, in Alberta, I think it's somewhat like 40, 40 50 percent of the prison population is indigenous, even though we make up 10 percent of the population. Child family services, upwards of 80% of children in chicken care are indigenous. And my argument has always been those numbers sh should be worse, actually. And the fact that they're not, I think, really goes back to our culture and, the, and our ability to build connection with each other. And so when I'm going back to community, when I'm working with the elders, again, I'm trying to build those relationships and build that connection. So here's just a few words that I found. So this is through the Kaosis First Nation. So this is a First Nation, I think, just east of Regina. And so they came up with these different terms that would describe an autistic person. So the first, first, first word is ka kama which iwini sit. So this is given a unique spirit, quiet spiritual intelligence. Uh, the second word is pitos manatunik ini sit, uh, which is given a way of thinking its own spiritual intelligence. And then the third word is make Amy Kusit, he toasts uh, meno tenet chicken, I think. <laughs> so given a different way of spiritual thinking. And then the fourth word is Amy Kusit, he AC Waskawi, which is given the move in a different way of being or characteristic. Now you can see the difference between this when it's translated into English. So you have words like spiritual intelligence, different way of thinking, spiritual thinking, different way of being. And then earlier, I, I showed you the DSM-5 and how negative that was. And so you can see that there's differences in how we operate. So decolonizing autism. So again, sometimes viewed as gifted. Um, one thing I, like, I tell people is neurodiversity did not start in the 90s. We've been practicing it for hundreds of years. I do a lot of ceremony. This can give me purpose. I would love to see on the land services and supports and then all of the sensory friendly cultural events. And now I'm gonna get asked this question. So how do I become, how do I support families better? It's all about relationships, become trauma informed, lean into that discomfort, look upstream for the solutions, meet the families where they're at, try and walk a mile in their moccasins, get to know them and be aware of performative reconciliation. So land acknowledgements without action behind them is performative, be flexible and patient. And finally, if you're interested, here's the short documentary that I had mentioned. Um, it is going to be in the resource list as well, which will be shared later by Autism Ontario. And finally, hi, hi, thank you. Here's all the amazing support, as well as my the team around me getting me through the PhD. Excellent, excellent. And you're right, that question. Um came up numerous times and I saved it uh, for the end. We're, we're, we're in um, the crunch time. I do have one question here I did want to get to before we do wrap up. Um, what would be some helpful ways for nonprofits to effectively incorporate the information that we've learned today? So, so there's some great resources out there. Now, I used to tell people that, you know, in the age of information, ignorance is a choice. I've had to revise that. Now we live in the age of misinformation. And so I know Autism Ontario is going to be sharing that resource list, but also looking for opportunities just to learn from the community. And again, thinking about the reciprocal nature of like, okay, if I'm in this community, I'm trying to learn, I have to also be thinking about what I'm going to give back. 
And so learn, and, and as soon as you start doing that, the community is going to be much more open to further that relationship building. So rather than you just showing up and expecting people to share their knowledge with you, you have to be able to say, I would love to learn from you, but here's some of the things that I can give back as well. Here's some of the sh my own knowledge or program services or whatever else may be. And then so really looking for to, a balanced approach to that relationship building. Excellent. Excellent. Um, we covered a lot of ground today, Grant. Um, if there's any message you'd like to leave with our audience before we go today, any, 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 any last thoughts for everyone? Yeah. So when I'm thinking about my experiences as a parent, mostly I really, some of the best relationships and the best people I've worked with outside of my community have always been the ones who have been open-minded. They're willing to be wrong and they listen. Now, my wife's a researcher as well. Um, she finished her master's last a couple months ago, and it looked at what good allyship looked like in Indigenous healthcare. And the number one finding she found was that good allies in our communities, they know how to listen. And the example I love using is like when you're having a conversation with somebody and it's just you and that one person and the other person's talking, are you actually listening to them or are you formulating a response while they're talking? Because if you're formulating a response while they're talking, you're not being present. And if you're not being present, you're not really listening. And if you're not really listening, they're not going to feel heard. So again, open-mindedness, willingness to be wrong, but also learning how to listen. And with that, we've run out of time. Thank you so much, Grant. And thanks to all of you. A reminder, this webinar will, will be recorded and will be available on the Autism Ontario website at some point tomorrow. If you know somebody who you think might find value in the information that was shared today, please share the link with them. Um, the more people we get through this program, the more of these events we're able to do. Um, there is a survey. We'd like you to respond on that so that you can help us do better and 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 book the guests and cover the content that, we, that you want to hear about. And other than that, thank you so much for your participation. And we look forward to seeing you on our next Autism Ontario event.